So if you do a really slow, mindful yawn, and do one with me right now. Oh, yeah, I can't help it, but <sighs> yawn a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You know, the one thing that literally every single diet and nutrition expert that we've had on the show seems to agree on is that we need to eat more veg and get our greens and consume all natural products. But let's be honest. How many of us actually have the time? Well, recently I had the opportunity to meet some of the folks over at Organifi and I've been absolutely blown away by them and their product. You see, Organifi is an organic superfood green juice powder that literally covers all your nutritional bases without having to eat five bowls of kale. It saves you loads of time, loads of money, and a lot of chewing. And really all you have to do is add water and drink it. So to check it out and save an incredible 20% off your first order, visit Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and use coupon code superhuman at checkout. This episode is brought to you by Become a Super Learner, the masterclass. You guys, if you have ever wanted to learn things faster, to read faster and waste less time reading boring textbooks, if you've ever wanted to have near perfect memory for names, numbers, anything you want to learn and expand your mind and retain information in a way that you never thought possible, well, then the Become a Super Learner Masterclass is exactly what you've been looking for. It's a 10-week program developed by myself and my mentors alongside some of the world's best memory experts and world record-holding memory champions. It'll take you from zero to super learning hero in just a matter of 10 weeks in about 30 minutes a day or less. Now, you can go ahead and sign up for a free trial with no credit card required. All you have to do is go to jle.vi slash learn. And if you choose to pick up the full course, you will also get an incredible discount for listeners of this podcast only. So please make sure to check it out and support the show. And on to today's episode. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode. You guys, before we get started, I got to read you to this review, uh, and I love the name of the reviewer. It's Occasional Reviewer 15 from the US of A, titled Brilliant Podcast. Thank you. The Becoming Superhuman podcast is one of the only podcasts I have ever subscribed to. The interviews with leading experts in different fields provide you with distilled knowledge of many popular books and seminars. Every episode leaves me with plenty to think about and easy changes to apply to my life. I also discovered new books and thought leaders by listening. Thank you, Jonathan, for running this podcast. It's had a significant impact on me. Wow. So day made. Really appreciate that. Thank you so, so very much, Occasional Reviewer, for that. On to today's episode, you guys. Today, we are joined by author, neuroscientific researcher, therapist, and the world's leading expert on spirituality and the brain, Mr. Mark Robert Waldman. Mark is actually faculty at Loyola Marymount University. Whoa, I can't speak today. And he's author of 13 books, including Words Can Change Your Brain and How God Changes Your Brain, the latter of which was actually nominated as a must-read by no other than Oprah Winfrey. You guys, he's also just published a new book, came out January 31st, called Neuro Wisdom. You guys, Mark's body of work is really just a formidable cornucopia of knowledge on the brain. He shares this super learning passion that I do and just devours knowledge, which he'll tell you guys all about in this interview. And he really talks to us about how we can influence the brain's development and behavior with something as simple as thoughts and beliefs and simple priming exercises. Completely fascinating. But don't worry, guys, this isn't going to be another episode 
where I go off into energies and spiritual woo-woo because Mark is actually a very respected researcher in the field of neuroscience and he's had his work published in peer-reviewed journals worldwide and publications ranging from Time Magazine to Forbes and the New York Times. So although we are going to talk about the S and M words, as he calls it, spirituality and meditation, we actually get very serious. And I think you're going to take away some really powerful neuroscientific knowledge today. Uh, We talk about God, we talk about neuroscience, we talk about psychedelics, spirituality, we talk about yawning. And we even go into a little bit about communications, authentic communication, and guided meditations. Yes, you will do a couple guided meditations. Please do not close your eyes and meditate if you are driving. But otherwise, it would be really, really cool if you guys practice the stuff that we do in this episode. I think you're going to love it. So now without any further ado, guys, let me present to you Mr. Mark Robert Waldman. Mr. Mark Robert Waldman, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Lots of energy. I'm really excited. It's just about nine o'clock here, so I'm excited that you're going to bring a boost of energy. It'll hopefully wake me up and then maybe I'll go out and be social (laughs) after. (laughs) Mark, thank you so much for making the time. I'm really, really excited. You know, I geek out a lot on neuroscience. It's one of my passions and interests, and I'm very fortunate to have turned some form of neuroscience, which is memory and mnemonic training, into my day job. So I'm really looking forward to it. Say, you know, you mentioned, you say, maybe this uh, interview will wake you up a little bit. Would you Mm -hmm. like to know the fastest way to wake up your entire brain? I would. I have a guess, but I I would like to know what it is. Go ahead and guess. I know you've read my work. (laughs) White light. I would say white light. Oh, absolutely not. That probably falls right into the category of pseudoscience. As a matter of fact, some of the, you know, the whole spectrum light Research that was going on that we needed it when you lived in in northern states is now turning out that it's messing up different parts of the circadian rhythms in your brain. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> no, it is yawning. Oh, interesting. That'll actually wake you up. Yeah. I mean, everybody thinks that uh, yawning is something that you do when you're tired, but that is why the brain (laughs) wants to yawn Mm -hmm. is because you are tired. That's why students in the early morning class are yawning because they stayed up all night. And that's the brain's mechanism for becoming more alert, more focused. That's why every single mammal and bird, what do they do when they wake up in the morning? They do basically three things. They yawn and they do a really slow yawn. You know, it's the kind of go... (sighs) You know, birds will open up their beaks really wide. Hippopotamuses will show you their entire dental arrangements. And uh, what happens is that when we are tired or when we've been concentrating for too long and we're starting to feel a little bit of work burnout, Mm. the brain starts to misfire in lots of ways. It becomes more active because you kind of need to have just two little tiny areas above your eyeballs for when you're focused on listening to a sentence that I'm saying or writing Mm. something down or performing a particular task. So if you do a really slow, mindful yawn and do one with me right now. Oh, yeah, I can't help it, but (sighs) yawn a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, yawning stimulates. You can even get your dogs and birds to yawn when you do it, too, because it actually creates a form of empathy between you and other Mammals and birds now have a brain that's considered more mammalian than it was reptilian. Wow. So if you do about three or four of these yawns, you'll begin to feel more alert. You'll be more relaxed. And in that brief period of relaxation, that's what allows the neurochemicals involved in focusing and concentration to uh, get reintegrated into your brain so you can do better work for the next five or ten minutes. So we insist to all of our executive MBA students and I use that in my neuro coaching when I'm working with people with personal problems, you're going to start out doing a bunch of mindful yawning. In other words, you yawn and you actually focus on being aware of how each single yawn shifts your consciousness a little bit, shifts your awareness, shifts your mood, and everyone becomes more and more and more relaxed, more focused, less stressed out. And sometimes a person will start to yawn for 20 or 30 minutes and they can't stop. And that's great because that's simply an example of how much stress that pain was carrying around. They even create high yawning and low yawning rats to experiment with uh, drug tests because 
Yawning is another thing the brain will do when you are being overly medicated. Interesting. I've yawned like six times since you've said that. It, it really is contagious. I just can't stop. <laughs> now, do you feel more alert or do you I feel do, actually, more songed out? <laughs> I do actually feel more alert. Mark, I have to ask, how did you get into neuroscience? Because you're clearly kind of a renaissance man and you're interested in business and neuroscience and spirituality. So how did your career trajectory kind of go? Opportunism, actually, I would say. <laughs> I was working on a book. I was a developmental editor for about 10 years with uh, Jeremy Tarcher of Tarcher Putnam. And he had a requirement uh, for me. Now, for those, most people don't know what the Tarcher imprint means in New York. But this was the company that first started to do books on new consciousness, uh, mm. awareness, spirituality in the brain, the famous book on writing from the left side of your brain, creative writing, the women's manifesto books were all published by Jeremy Tarcher. And Jeremy wanted me to do a specific book of putting out the most radical, controversial religious and spiritual perspectives that were out there, like uh, Reverend Spong, who over in New Jersey, this is back in the 1990s, he was the first Episcopalian church to begin to ordain lesbian women as priests. Mm. So in putting together that anthology, I had come across a book by Andy Newberg called Why God Won't Go Away. Hmm. And Andy was the first person to do brain scan studies of both nuns and Buddhists doing different forms of contemplative prayer. And he discovered that the neural mechanisms were exactly the same in these Buddhists who were focusing on pure consciousness and the nuns who were basically reflecting on passages from the Bible and wanting to feel closer and a deeper connection to Jesus. So we began to see that contemplative spiritual practices, no matter where they are taking place around the world, no matter what the theology is, has a particular neurological fingerprint, shall we say. And it stimulates the social awareness parts of the brain. It stimulates the empathy centers in the brain. It actually creates more, it lowers stress. It helps a person literally live longer. And it actually changes the genetic expression of many immune enhancing genes throughout the body. So I read Andy's book and I wanted to take an excerpt from that book. But I couldn't do it. You see, normally I don't want to contact the author because I'm going to excerpt parts of their book and put it into a anthology that may have a very different perspective than what the author wanted. Instead, I would just say, you know, send a few hundred dollars over to the publisher. But I couldn't do that with Andy's work. It was just one of the things that was like a sentence here and a sentence paragraph there. So I sent them an email and I said, Andy. I really like your work. Nobody else has really published anything at that particular time. His research ended up on the cover of Newsweek back in 2000. And I wanted to take parts of the book, parts of his academic research paper, parts of some of the other things he had written elsewhere and weave it together into an original piece. And he said, well, sure, do that. And then I found out something amazing. I found out that Andy can't write. Hmm. He had hired a ghostwriter to turn all of this very sophisticated, you know, neuroscientific. I mean, if you you, know, you go to PubMed and you open up a neuroscientific review, half the times Andy can't even tell me what he meant in a paragraph that he's written. You know, I think my favorite part of the brain that I love is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex because nobody can repeat that. <laughs> so I told Andy I would be happy to be his uh, – editor and help him with his next book. But it turned out that the book that we created was, the title was Born to Believe. I ended up doing half of the research for that particular book because I didn't know anything about neuroscience at all. I had created an academic literature review journal in the field of transpersonal psychology, but that's a totally different field. I had to give myself a crash course in this. So I literally lived on PubMed.gov for <laughs> many months, reading and reviewing probably 3,000 abstracts and articles per week, and eventually put everything together. But still, I didn't know if, if what I was saying 
made any sense. So Andy had to confirm everything. So I had to create, put endnotes in for everything. So, for example, one of the things that I had said to Andy in one of our conversations, his research showed that when you engage in these contemplative relaxation processes, we know that when you get emotionally upset, for example, it shuts down your frontal lobes that are re- responsible for logical decision making. So you lose your balance. You get emotionally angry and upset and whatever else. And this shuts down your frontal lobe capacity to make a reasonable decision. Well, I said to Andy, guess what? The same thing occurs. The more you think, the more you focus with the front part of your brain, the more you have optimistic thoughts, for example, this shuts down the negative emotional centers in deeper parts of your brain. He said, no, it doesn't do that. I said, well, here, let me send you these 35 studies that say otherwise. And he looked at it and he said, oh, my God, you're right. So in that book, we published a very important piece of scientific discovery that had immediate practical relevance. The more you turn up the emotional centers in your brain, the more you turn off your ability to be observant, logical, rational, or reasonable, and vice versa. So it's like you could create a seesaw. And let's say you're feeling a whole bunch of anxiety. Well, count backwards from 100 by 7. That requires such a particular type of abstract cognitive activity that it turns off your ability to feel anxious or angry, or sad, or depressed. And so we began to reverse engineer many of these findings to create what I like to call practical neuroscience. What can we discover about the human brain that we can actually change its structure and function in ways that improve our life? That's how Andy and I got together. And we've done uh, five books together so far, and we're about to create a new proposal. Hopefully it'll go through on sex, God, and the brain. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I want to backtrack almost to the beginning of what you said and take it piece by piece. I guess the first question is, you talked about spirituality and belief in God or a higher power, irrespective of which one it is, as giving immune benefits, as calming. I mean, Is this to say that actually having some spiritual belief, and I know this is going to be controversial, but having some spiritual belief actually makes you happier, healthier, more intelligent, more grounded, more emotionally stable? I mean, at a neuroscientific level? Before I answer that question, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. How do you define spirituality? Mm, Well, that's funny. I was going to ask you the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I would say it's believing in something beyond what we see in our day-to-day reality. So believing, you know, whether you believe in, and by the way, I think science can be a form of spirituality, right? If you're a theoretical physicist, there's almost a level of spirituality in the way that you pursue literally looking at the face of God, right? Quantum, uh, the grand unified theory, if you will. But I believe it's believing in something that is far beyond what we see and, and that there's a certain mysticism or mystery to our existence on this planet. Now, I'm going to teach you and everyone who is listening a particular strategy. Love it. I want you to say everything you just said in 10 words or less, mm. because that's all the human brain can remember. Okay. So spirituality is believing in a higher power or greater force. Question in 10 words or less, and I'm counting those words on my fingers. What is a higher power? Mm, An unseen force that influences events. Is that inside of you or outside of you? Both. Now, let's do another experiment. I'm going to show you how to access the intuitive centers in your brain, which is part of what we've identified as the spirituality circuits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So close your eyes for a moment Mm -hmm. and give me a yawn and a stretch. Just listen to the sound of this bell. I don't know how clearly it'll come through. And drop yourself down into the deepest sense of relaxation that you can. And let's assume for the moment 
that there is more than one inner voice in your head. And we know from neuroscience that there's a number of levels of inner speech. There's negative critical voices that are actually chattering in your right prefrontal cortex. And there are positive optimistic voices chattering away in your left prefrontal cortex. But there's another voice that almost doesn't have words. And it's this observational awareness. And I want you to imagine that there's this deep inner voice, almost like an inner sage, an inner voice of wisdom. And I want you to contemplate. I actually want you to meditate on this simple sentence. What is spirituality? And pay attention to what your intuition says. And all of you listening can do this at home as well. Close your eyes, relax. Go deeply inside of yourself and just ask that intuitional voice. It's like a whisper. What is spirituality? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Hmm. I would say, so I've recently gone through a lot of really profound experiences of just realizing how much is unknown by contrast to what I used to think, everything was logical and scientific and evolution. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is unknown. So take a moment and I want you to savor that word unknown. It's like immerse yourself in the feeling sense of that word unknown. I'm actually teaching you a meditation practice called mindfulness. And we do this with all of our executive MBA students as well. Immerse yourself in that sense of an unknown and tell me the very next thing that pops into your mind intuitively. Acceptance. Now, take a moment and immerse yourself in all of the physical and emotional senses of acceptance. Feel your body, your mind, your whole inner universe with a sense of acceptance. And everyone else can do that, too. You can all focus in on the word of acceptance, immerse yourself in it, let it flow through you. And tell me how it makes you feel. Easy. That is what we are calling a spiritual state of awareness. Mm. And because the word spirituality is such a buzzword in many communities and means something different in every culture, we now just use the word mindfulness. What happens if I deeply relax and allow myself to tap into these intuitive whispers? And we now know where they come from. They come from an area that's situated about halfway between your conscious thinking and decision making circuits and the emotional circuits in your brain. And from this point of self-observation, it's like you begin to watch all of the positive and negative thoughts you have, all the positive and negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And as you sit there and you watch it, they're constantly changing. It's constantly flowing through you. And this turns out to be the underlying principle in all contemplative spiritual practices. You simply become aware of the different thoughts, feelings, and sensations relating to any topic you want to explore. And so this becomes the fastest, easiest way to teach anybody how to get in touch with their own inner spirituality. And so what I would say, if you do this experience and you write down three, four, or five words and even ask yourself this question, what is my deepest innermost value? What is my deepest innermost value? Mm. What's the first word that pops into your mind? Love. And I'll ask you again for another deep inner value. Kindness. So now we have acceptance, love, kindness. If you do this in a room, filled with hundreds of people who are Muslims and Christians and Hindus and Jews and atheists, they will all come up with a set of values that everyone will look up and say to each other, yeah, I can agree with that. That is a virtue. 
those values is a definition of your own inner spirituality. So we guide people into through these inner values exercises in our executive MBA program in businesses and organizations to hold classrooms of freshmen at universities, for example. And when you anchor yourself in any of those inner value words, you'll feel the stress drain away from you. And for the next hour of work, you'll be more productive. That's tapping in to your own spirituality without having to define it in any theological way. And so you can take any contemplative meditation from any spiritual tradition, strip it of its theology, put it into a different spiritual or religious tradition, and we'll see in our brain scans the same neurological circuit. And it's one that touches into your values. Your values is part of the ethical system of your brain. And ethics is the way in which you decide what is the right and wrong way to act or behave in relationship to the other people in the world. That is our definition of spirituality, mm. your deepest innermost values that give your life meaning and purpose. So in a sense, no matter how agnostic a person is, it's essentially you're saying from a neuroscientific perspective worthwhile to develop even if it's simply a mindfulness practice some level of spiritual belief system correct, correct. but we just don't have to use the s and m words spirituality and meditation yeah <laughs> the s and m words <laughs> i for example had a mystical experience many years ago where i looked up looked out the window and suddenly everything came alive the trees the asphalt driveway the posts, the mess on the floor, and it all just seemed perfect. And I went, oh, my God, that's what all those Hindus and Buddhists have been talking about. And it put me into such a state of inner peace that I've never, ever forgotten that moment. And it's guided my life for all of these many years. And the weirdest thing for me was I came to the realization that when I die, that's it. There's no Heaven, no hell, no God. And I went, uh-oh. I mean, I was an ordained minister at that particular time. What do I do now? Wow, I didn't catch that anywhere in your bio. Tell me about the journey from there to here. Which part? Being an ordained minister and now, I mean, so we haven't gotten to it yet, but now teaching in a business school, specifically around communication and, <laughs> and neuroscience, that sounds like a really interesting quarter, mid, or two-thirds life crisis. Yes, that was a transformational experience. I was part of a group, as you know, in the, or as you may not know, because I am uh, 65. So I go all the way back when I graduated college. I graduated from UC Santa Cruz with basically a degree in psychedelics because that's what everyone took on. I was going to ask. <laughs> you know, on different weekends. So all of us, we were into exploring every form of alternative consciousness and how could you get there? And so I read an awful lot in that particular area, but I also went through a semi-psychoanalytic and semi-spiritual organization where we became licensed as ministers to do consulting with other individuals. Mm. There were some pretty bad people in that organization. And when I had this particular mystical experience, I had begun to do some genuine, good psychoanalytic supervisory work with a man named Bruno Bettelheim. And then since he was 82 and we knew he was going to die soon, I had my second mystical experience. And it just came to me in the following way. The thought came to me, oh, here I'm practicing as a psychoanalyst and a ministerial counselor, and I don't know the first thing about psychology or religion or spirituality. So in our last book that I wrote with Andy Newberg called How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, we explore these mini aha experiences and the big oh wow experiences. And I basically went like this. I went, oh wow, I've made this incredible discovery, followed by oh, shit, I don't know anything about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that set me on an obsessive-compulsive reading binge where I got up to reading 
300 books a year and reviewing them in the transpersonal review. And I began to realize, wow, there's over 500 schools of psychology, 50 different theoretical perspectives. How am I ever going to figure out which one's right for me? How am I going to solve my own messed up personality? Because I was just a highly anxious individual. And that was where I had the idea, well, I guess I'm just going to have to trust my intuition. And that was the first time I moved from being helpless and dependent upon other people telling me what was wrong with me and how to fix me to starting to trust my own intuition. Why neuroscience became so important to me is that starting in 2008, which is quite recently, and these experiences, you understand, happened to me in 1989, mm. we now know that intuition is a specific neural circuit that you can arbitrarily tap into to solve problems more rapidly. That's what the brain science shows. So I find that brain science, even though it's highly speculative at this time, still offers us a few key facts about the nature of human awareness, human consciousness. And what I've always wanted to do is say, well, let's use that. Let's teach a person. How can you get into that intuitive state? How can you right. empower yourself to find an answer? You listen to all that information. And we do, and when I'm doing neuro coaching, for example, the same thing. I ask the client to listen to the bell, to yawn, to stretch, to relax, to go into this deep state of mindfulness and awareness. And I ask them to say, here's how they're thinking about their problem. What does your intuition say? And the intuition comes through like, a different voice. And some people consider that voice the voice of God. Other people just consider it like an inner teacher or a sage. And from a neuroscientific perspective, it's a factual, experiential way in which the brain processes information and solves problems in its own creative way. And it's just outside of the language centers of the brain. Wow. I'm curious to ask, because we've talked a lot about psychedelics on the show and their potential for, I don't want to use now the S or the M word, but for mindfulness uh -huh. and for presence and for all these incredibly powerful things. After the two experiences that you had, you know, having a degree in psychedelics, as you so wonderfully <laughs> put it, and also doing the neuroscientific work, what's your opinion? And, you know, say if you had kids today who are considering experimenting, what would you say to them about psychedelics? I would say it's the most incredible journey to take and the most dangerous journey to take. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but if you are going to do it, by all means, do it with somebody who is very experienced because you're very vulnerable. Oh, yes. When we look at brain scan studies of people on a psychedelic, we come back to that original statement I made in the beginning of this interview. When you are asleep and when you are dreaming, your brain is far more active than when you wake up and you're focused on doing task A, task B, and task C. When you take a psychedelic, it opens up all those parts of the brain that are normally inactive when you're awake. So you're in your dream state and your awake state and in your meditative state, and you can enter areas that are just purely psychotic. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem with psychedelics. If you do have an underlying personality disorder, it can make it blossom completely. Oh, yes. And you don't come back. I had kind of made it a uh, practice. I thought I wanted to try out a different psychedelic once every five years because it usually takes me about a year to process a single event. Mm. But I did... OD, shall we say, on DMT a number of years ago, I had been given one form that was very pleasant and euphoric. And, you know, it's a psychedelic experience that only lasts for five to 15 minutes. I didn't know there was a different kind. And so I went to a shaman and he gave me this other type, which is kind of more like uh, a psychedelic version of speed. Oh and I decided to be brave and you know, you fill up the bags with the smoke. And whereas I'd maybe, you know, had maybe taken in maybe a quarter of a bag at other times in my life, I inhaled three of these bags. Oh, God. 
it was an amazing experience. I traveled back through history. I became every animal and I was roaring and yelling and growling and kind of like going wahoo, like a wild cowboy on a bronco. And I was surrounded by many of my friends who were there for support. And I said, well, I want to be a great neuroscientist. I want to make a great neuroscientific discovery. What will that be? And absolutely nothing came to me. And then I ask, well, is there really a God? You know, because again, remember that first experience turned me from being an agnostic into an atheist. I'm going, well, okay, is that really true? I mean, there's no way for science to prove or disprove the existence of God. And I ask, is there a God? And again, in this full-blown psychedelic experience, the answer was, nope, God is whatever you need to create it for. If you create a negative version of God, it's very neurologically destructive. If you maintain a totally optimistic view of God, all of our research shows that's very neurologically and psychologically enhancing. And the coolest thing is, is that we've done interviews of thousands of people, and it turns out that nearly everyone has a totally different definition of God. You can walk into a fundamentalist church and ask the two ministers, give me a definition of a God, and by the time they answer, they'll look at each other and go, you crazy? That's not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So let me ask this, because my goal with the show and our logo in the show is skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. But yes. we can't in good faith tell the audience, hey, it would really benefit you start believing in God. So if you don't already. So how can someone practically take advantage of what the research shows? Is it as simple as meditating, doing these meditative activities and believing that they connect you to kind of other forces in the universe? Is that enough, I guess? Here's what we write about. Here's what we teach. Whether I, you know, because I am oftentimes invited to many different denominations to teach these, a wide range of spiritual practices. And I like to introduce people to spiritual practices from all the world's religions. One, if you go into a deep, relaxed state, you can ask your intuition to tap in to your entire belief system about God, the universe, the nature of everything. And if you listen to your intuition and pay attention to all the different thoughts and feelings that move through it, you will, in essence, be deepening that spirituality circuit in your brain. If God has great meaning and purpose to you, by all means, have a conversation with God. If you're an agnostic and you don't know whether that's an outside force coming through you or an inside force being generated by your neurons, it doesn't really matter. The brain could care less about most facts. The brain basically wants to achieve its goal. And so if you're on a spiritual path, ask yourself, why are you on that path? And most people say, I want more peace. I want to feel more connected to myself and others. I want to have a sense that my nature continues forever, for example. But if, like me, you have an experience, suddenly there's no heaven, no hell, no God, and I ask myself, okay, what is the value of being an atheist? What came to me in that intuitive state was I had to live each moment of my life as fully as possible. I can't put off until an afterlife. So for me... If there was a God, I'd probably have more questions and not sure which way to turn. But for those people who have a deep sense that God is real, then by all means, have a dialogue with God in that deeply relaxed, intuitive state. And nine times out of ten, the information that you get will enhance your life. And if you don't have a spiritual belief, just focus again on what are your deepest innermost values. What's the deepest value I have for relationship or communication? Then if you immerse yourself in that value word, you will stimulate the same spirituality circuit and you'll live your life by your highest, deepest values. And that's what all world's religions teach us. Incredible. I want to also talk to you, Mark, about communication, because I understand you, as I said at the beginning of the interview, teach at a Loyola Marymount Business School. Yes. I think it's so fascinating 
that we have a neuroscientific researcher actually inside classrooms, not only teaching the mindfulness stuff, but connecting all of it to how we communicate. So talk to me a little bit about, to quote the title of your book, How Words Can Change Your Brain. In that book, and this also grew out of our meditation research that I was doing with the Transpersonal Psychology Organization back in the 1990s, because a lot of psychologists and therapists also had spiritual practices. And the question was this, if you sat down and you went into a deep state of meditation while you're facing another person and simply let that intuitive spiritual part of you speak a few sentences and let the other person deeply listen to that and respond, we found that in about 10 minutes, a profound state of intimacy emerged when you talk to people using this compassionate communication strategy. So we had originally created this to help couples in conflict. So two people come into your office you have them relax, you have them focus in on their deepest inner values, you share those values, you have them speak to each other from those values. And this eliminates the psychological ability to go into defensiveness. Then with the brain scan research that came up, we began to find out to see exactly how this interrupts the neurological circuits of distrust, fear, anxiety. So we were using psychology and neuroscience to say, here's a very quick way to enter a state of relaxed awareness, another word for mindfulness. And if you stay in that state, you can help a couple through a divorce while they remain true to their deepest values, which often includes kindness and compassion and peacefulness, for example. So it ended up that I started to teach all of these programs to divorce mediation groups. And what we found, if we brought these same communication strategies, okay, deeply relax, maintain a soft eye contact with a person, recall a deep, pleasant memory that causes a half smile on your face. The neuroscience shows that when you see somebody with that half smile, you'll neurologically trust them even if they're a sociopath. So sociopaths know how to, you know, manipulate that. You watch Bernie Madoff and he had that soft, sweet smile all the way to prison. Hmm. And so we teach our executive MBA students how to communicate in this way, to take a few minutes before going into an important meeting, for example, focus in on what's my deepest innermost value for this meeting. Make sure I'm mentally relaxed, do a few yawns, do a few stretches. Focus on a deep inner value. Focus on a pleasant memory so I get that beautiful smile on my face. Walk a little more slower in that room. And we demonstrate to all of our students with each other that they can now, if they stay in the state, solve any business or personal problem in about five or ten minutes when it usually takes two or three hours in any other type of situation. We found why I was hired to be part of every year of the class and everyone takes this class in their very first day is that if you even just spent 60 seconds once each morning thinking about what your deepest value should be to anchor yourself to for the rest of the day in 90 percent of our students stress levels went down work productivity went up when we went to go publish this in an academic journal psychological journal They were suspicious because nobody gets results that are that high. It's usually 35 or 40 percent, which Mm -hmm. is slightly above placebo. So instead, we had it published in the Journal of Executive Education. That became the most popular downloaded article in the 10-year history of that journal. And we now go around the world teaching corporations how to do this mindfulness-based meditative communication practice. It only takes uh, 45 minutes of training To do this, sales go up. I mean, when American Express executives, they were divided into two groups. Half of them were given a compassion and forgiveness meditation to do for a weekend. At the end of the year, their sales were almost double to the people who were not in that contemplative class, in that mindfulness class, doing these very powerful, simple meditation strategies. So they all came out of these spiritual traditions, which Andy Newberg and I 
we're one of the world's leading teams on that. And Richie Davidson and others are the other world's leading teams on that. They're looking at mindfulness. We just look at all the different spiritual practices. And we also know that there are fast ways to really, you know, we're back to the psychedelic question. Yes. Well, if you begin to deepen your breathing and you take a particular word or phrase or sound like la, 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 or even going om, 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 and you add maybe a little rhythm to it, a little beat, a little bit of ritual body movement, you'll enter these altered states of consciousness where your frontal lobes turn off, Mm -hmm. your sense of self immediately disappear. Mm. And this is as close that you can get to a psychedelic state. Then if you come back out of that state, go back into the contemplative state and just ask your intuition, what insight did I gain from that experience? The individual almost always come up with a profound new realization that they can immediately apply to their lives. Right. So that's what we do. We teach people how to have instant mini enlightenment experiences. Right. And it makes really perfect sense, right? I mean, if I had to translate that and explain that to someone who is completely cynical, I think it'd be very easy. I would say you're bringing yourself into the present moment, bringing awareness into the present moment. And then obviously, when you sit down to communicate to another human being, you're not in the negative interaction that you had in the taxi on the way here. You're not in where you're going to be for lunch in two hours. And you're also not in your head in your own insecurities. You're just super connected to that other person in the present moment. So of course you would communicate better. Of course, I mean, the neurochemistry part is almost the cherry on top that, you know, your brain functions in this way, but it's just also so imminently understandable that if your awareness is in that interaction and you're focused on the other human being. And the most important thing that we discovered was that you don't have to do long-term meditations of 20, 30, 40 minutes, Mm -hmm. just 60 seconds of contemplative awareness once every hour is enough to create the kind of brain changes that we see if you do this for, you know, like I said, a few minutes a day after, you know, normally we bring people back in after eight weeks and we'll see the same type of empathy develop, self-love develop, confidence increasing. So we can measure them psychologically and we can see the same neurological fingerprint taking place. So even just making a commitment to do one mindful breath each day, this is what Meng, who you know is one of the founders of Google, mm-hmm. created in their program. Just make a commitment to do one mindful breath or one super slow stretch. Just watch that breath. Give your full attention to that breathing. That's enough to organize your brain for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, and you'll do better work. Yeah. So I was going to ask you for a homework assignment for the audience, but it sounds that that is a very specific and very good one, in fact. So here's 10 of them. Make a commitment to do just one mindful breath a day. Mm. As you breathe in, just notice how the air flows in through your nose, the cool air. As you breathe out, notice the warm air. Or put your hand on your chest and belly, and as you breathe in, Feel how it rises, and as you breathe out, feel how it decreases. One mindful breath. Then, in super slow motion, take a full 60 seconds to slowly roll your head or twist your torso and just immerse yourself in all the tiny, subtle sensations you have. That's all you need to get rid of physiological stress, but you have to go super slow for your brain to recognize where those tiny little places of tension are. Then take a moment and ask yourself, what is your deepest value that you want to bring into your next hour of work or into your next dialogue with another person? And just spend 60 seconds savoring that word. For yours, it was acceptance and kindness. For mine, it's peace and connection. Take a moment and think of one thing that you feel grateful for today. Take a moment right now. Just visualize something that you feel grateful for. Maybe it's a person. 
Maybe it's a situation you've been in. Notice how that makes you feel. Or take one minute to simply think about all of the accomplishments you've had in the last day, in the last week. That's all it takes to train a pessimistic, worrisome mind and turn it into an optimistic, satisfied mind. I love it. Mark, that's a fantastic note to end on. So I just want to give you an opportunity before we close out the show and finish our time here to tell the audience where they can learn about your New Era Wisdom programs, check out your books and learn more about you. Go to markrobertwaldman.com. And if you want to experience a personal neuro coaching session with me, you'll find a place there. If you want to check out our new book, That is called Neuro Wisdom, the New Brain Science of Money, Happiness, and Success. That includes all of the strategies that I've been sharing with you here. This is part of our textbook that we use in our executive MBA program. You'll also find out about the NeuroCoach training and certification program we've just created. And you'll find a bunch of very wonderful, simple audio programs that will help train your mind in mindfulness, in positivity, and have fun with it. And feel free to send me any questions that you have. Incredible. Mark Robert Waldman, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It both energized me and calmed me down and put me in a more grounded place. So I really do appreciate it. And I know our audience is going to love the episode. It's been a great deal of fun. Awesome. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right, super friends. That's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.